welcome everyone to the first meeting. So this is something we've been praying about for quite a while. Um, seems like there are some who have a pretty good grasp of church history and others that don't, but I think it's a very important thing for all of us to, to understand, and I'm going to give a few reasons why we want to look into church history. It's quite a challenge to try to put, put this together. It's 2,000 years, and we want to cover it in an hour and a half. So, And I, I really don't want this to be just a history lesson. So I, I hope there's some things we can really take away from this, um, kind of going along with the hymns that we sang, that we could get a sense of the grace of God down through the centuries and to give us an encouragement to hold and value the truth that we have. So first of all, um, a little bit of an agenda. We want to talk about why are we going to look into church history. Then I want to jump right to the end and ask this very important question. Will the church be a success in the end? And then we want to use an outline of church history that's not of man's making, but of God's making. And so the Bible contains an outline in the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And... Um, how many here, just by a show of hands, are familiar with church history from Revelation 2 and 3? So about, I would say about half. So that's, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm unfortunately not going to be able to walk through in detail every verse, but I just want to give an overview of Revelation 2 and 3 and then bring in details from church history as we go. Um, but each of the letters that were written in Revelation 2 and 3 by the Lord Jesus delivered by the Apostle John to seven assemblies in Asia Minor or Turkey, modern-day Turkey, represents a period of church history. Ephesus, um, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And so we'll just briefly go through some of those things, and we'll probably take a break after Pergamos, and um, then at the end, conclude, where are we today? And um, what, what can we conclude from all of this? So the first question is, why is it important to know church history? A lot of people think it's not important to know church history, but I believe it is. And there's a number of reasons. Um, the first one I'll give is that general interest in the things of God. The church of God has been God's habitation on earth for the last 2,000 years. He's been living on earth through the church. And if he has, then that's something that should mean a lot to us. If he's interested in the church and its history, so should we. Secondly, it helps us to understand how we got to where we are today. We look around in the church today and we see that it's a mess. How did it get to be a mess? We see various denominations in Christendom today. How did these de denominations come to be? We see differences on points of doctrine. How did that come to be? So it's, you can look into church history and find the origin of these things. So that's helpful. And thirdly, it'll produce repentance in us. As we look at the history of the church, we're going to see failure. We're going to see that man has failed, that we have failed. And if we take that to heart, it'll, it'll produce repentance in our hearts, which will actually change us. And that's something that God wants to see for there to be spiritual growth. And that's really what we want to focus on today, is that um, the moral change that God wants to see in our hearts. And to give an example of this, we can think of the Apostle John. In Revelation chapter 1, he received a vision. He was told in the first few verses of the book of Revelation that he was going to be told things which must shortly come to pass. And so he's going forward into prophecy, but then he hears behind him a voice. So he's going forward, and then he has to turn backwards to hear this voice, which says, what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven assemblies, to Ephesus, Smyrna, and so on. And I turned back to see the voice which spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and so on. So here he was going to go forward into prophecy, and God says, no. Before you can go forward, you first need to look back. And we have to look back in order to get God's thoughts about the past. And that's what we really have in Revelation 2 and 3, is God's thoughts about the church's history. So here's a scriptural 
reason for us to look into church history, get his thoughts about the past, and if we do that, then he will reveal more truth to us. If we're unwilling to acknowledge what he said about the past, then we can't expect him to reveal more truth to us. So the question then is, will the church be a success? This is a very important question. Um, There's a lot of folks in the the world today that are Christians that believe the church has done a great job. Um, How many here think the church has done a great job? I don't see any hands. Um, But we wanted to ask, what does God say about this question? Well, will the church be a success? No. No. In man's responsibility, the church will end in failure. Previous dispensations, like Israel in the Old Testament, ended in failure, ended them in being expelled from the land of Israel. The church as well is going to end in failure. But there's another aspect, and that's in God's sovereignty, the church will be a success. God has a purpose for the church, and he is going to accomplish that purpose in spite of man's failure. But you have two outcomes In church history, one is man's side and the other is God's side. And the final result of the church and man's responsibility is the false church. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Looking something like this if you study the book of Revelation. In the words of Donald Trump, a nasty woman. (laughs) But there's another woman. There's another woman, okay? But first of all, this woman, all she cares about is herself. All she cares about is her own pleasure. And the word of God is clear that she is repulsive to the heart of God and to the heart of Christ. She has no care for the interests of Christ, but whatever will satisfy her. But there's another woman, and that is the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ. (laughs) Looking something like this. I don't know if... That's what you would consider to be a beautiful woman, but um, I, I picked I picked the first thing that came up. Um, both women, both uh, the false church and the true church are presented as women. The false church is the harlot. The the true church is the bride of Christ. Both are represented also as cities. The false church is Babylon the Great. The true church is Holy Jerusalem. So there's a great contrast between these two things. And as I said before, as with every other dispensation, in man's responsibility, it's going to end in failure. But God has a purpose. And his purpose will be accomplished in the end. So we can take courage from that. In the end, Christ will present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So we can take encouragement from that. So now, um, the, the history of the seven golden candlesticks. So John sees a vision looking something like this. I don't know exactly what it looks. This is an artist's rendition, but he saw seven golden candlesticks, seven stars, and one in the midst of the candlesticks who was dressed something like this. Now, the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. The first verse of the book of Revelation is the key that tells you it's a symbolic book. It says that he signified these things. So these things are symbols, and and I don't have to guess what these symbols mean. The word of God tells us exactly what they mean. He says that the seven candlesticks are the seven assemblies in Asia Minor. He says that the seven stars are the angels of those seven assemblies. Now, the word angel is used in several different ways, at least three different ways, But one of the ways that the word angel is used is to represent those who are responsible. And so these letters that we're going to read are addressed to those who are responsible in those seven assemblies. And then the one who's walking in the midst of the candlesticks is the Son of Man is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he's dressed is as a judge. I'm not going to go through all the way he is dressed, but to put it this way, he's a judge and he is assessing the state of his people, the church. And as I said before, the letters are addressed from the Lord himself, not from the Apostle John, but from the Lord himself to the seven assemblies. So there are three ways you could take Revelation 2 and 3. I'm sure many of you have heard this before, but 
You know, they were seven historical, literal assemblies, and they tell us something about what was going on in Ephesus, Smyrna, in each of those individual assemblies. You can take them in an allegorical way, and we can apply those things that we learn from those letters to us at the present time. I can look around today, and I can see something of Ephesus, and something of Smyrna, and something of Laodicea today, in the world today, in Christendom today. I can apply it to my own life in that way. But there's a third way, and that's a prophetic application. And that is the one we want to focus on today. We know the number seven is God's number of of completeness. And so these seven churches give us a complete picture of church history down through the ages. So that's what we want to focus on today. Just to briefly go over it on a timeline to show you where these seven churches fall. And then we want to continually come back to this timeline as we progress. So the first period was covered by um, the letter to Ephesus. And each of these churches has a meaning to the name, and it has something to do with what went on during that period. But So Ephesus, Smyrna, and then Pergamos. These first three churches are successive in history, which means they um, one begins where the other one leaves off. And that's different for the last four. But the first three are unique in that way. And then those, those periods have opened and closed in history. And another thing that's interesting about the first three is that at any point during that, those first three great periods, if the church had repented and turned back to God, God could have restored them back to the days of Pentecost, to the early days of the church. But once we get to the fourth church, that opportunity is no longer available. So the last four churches coexist till the Lord's coming. And those would be Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I have some dates up there. Um, don't quote me on those dates. I think they're fairly accurate, but you'll see um, different dates on different charts if you look around. And this is, this is going to be made available later, so don't feel like you have to strain your eyes to read, to read everything. So if you're taking notes. So the last four coexist to the Lord's coming. They all mention the Lord's coming in some way for that church. So we know they continue to the Lord's coming. And God begins to work with only a remnant. The opportunity for the whole church universally to repent and be brought back to its early days and its best time is no longer available. And now God's going to work with just a small remnant within that church. So we want to start with Ephesus. So Ephesus means desirable. And of all these periods, Ephesus, you might say, is the, the best state of the church overall among all these periods. So the period given to us under Ephesus really is after the death of the apostles and their delegates. And really the apostle John is a bit of an exception because he was the youngest of the Lord's disciples. I think he was around 17 years old or something like that when the Lord called him. He was a very young man and he lived to a very old age. So he outlived the other apostles by by 15 or 20 years. So he's able to write within the Ephesus period. They are commended for various things in these letters, and they're rebuked for various things in these letters, but in Ephesus they're commended for rooting out false apostles. There were those that said, oh, I'm an apostle, but they weren't appointed by the Lord Jesus, and they were false. And those in Ephesus did a very good job rooting them out, trying them, finding them guilty, and um, excommunicating them. They're also commended for continuing in all the right things. They are commended for their labor and their patience and so on. And they are commended for all doing all the right things, but they are rebuked for leaving their first love. And the word first there could be is really the idea of first in priority, not so much first chronologically. In other words, they didn't give Christ the first place in their hearts. And so while they continued doing all the right things, the affection for Christ was gone. And we know what that's like. We can apply that to ourselves. You know, the second that you fall out of communion with the Lord, you don't immediately start doing bad things. And um, they're exhorted to repent. And if they don't repent, down the road, the church will become a failure as a candlestick and will have to be removed. And here's a little illustration that I came up with for better, for worse, let's say you have a 
Major League Baseball pitcher, and he's pitching a fastball. When he pitches that ball, and it first leaves his hand, it's going perfectly straight, perfectly horizontal. But if you watch that ball over time, it begins to fall. But if you look at that early part, where it's, it hasn't fallen, it's going perfectly straight, there's no perceptible drop, but it's already fallen. The ball is already falling. That's like Ephesus. When we lose our affection for Christ, we're already falling, even though it's not visible. And all we have to do is wait, and eventually the ball will drop. So I don't know if that helps or not, but it's kind of what happened in the Ephesus period. So just to give a little bit of a timeline, at the, be- at the end of the book of Acts, we have the imprisonment of the Apostle Paul. Paul was set at liberty And in AD 64, there was a great fire in the city of Rome. It was almost a third of the whole city of Rome was consumed by fire. And and that led to the great persecution of of Nero. And so what happened was, after this fire, the Roman emperor Nero, who was a very cruel man, he rolled out plans to rebuild that city of Rome. And those plans were so detailed that they knew there was no way he had drawn up those plans after the fire, that this had been something that had been in the works for a long time. So it was pretty clear to everyone that Nero was behind the starting of this fire, and he was trying to clear away real estate to, to rebuild parts of the city. So people knew that Nero was responsible, so to put blame off of himself, he blamed it on the Christians. And so this led to Nero's uh, great persecution, from 65 to 68. And it was during this period that the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul, I think also Andrew, were martyred at this time. And it was an awful time of persecution. And again, I'm not going to get into all these details, but um, it was a great period of persecution. Many were killed in, in horrible ways. And then the next thing that comes on the scene is the Jewish war. So again, around this time, the Jews began to revolt against the Roman Government. You kind of saw that in the Gospels. There were those that were in prison, like Barabbas, for insurrection. That means rebelling against the Roman authorities. Well, they continued to rebel and rebel, and eventually the Roman government needed to put down this rebellion. At first, unsuccessfully. And then they sent this man, Vespasian, who was a brilliant general, to um, the land of Israel with like 60,000 troops. But before he was able to reach Jerusalem, he was called back to Rome to actually become the next emperor in, uh, in 69. And his son, Titus, who was also a brilliant empire general, was left to finish the job. He laid siege to Jerusalem in 70 AD. He killed, uh, I believe, upwards of a million Jews, according to what we, what we know in history. And a lot of um, what we get in the New Testament is, is around the fall of Jerusalem and around the destruction that occurred. The Lord spoke about it. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, this is what it was in reference to. This kind of sets the stage. So you get the fall of Jerusalem. But then after Nero, the persecution under Nero stopped, there was a long period of general peace for Christians, but there were intermittent bursts of persecution. Once in a while there would be an emperor who was unfavorable, and they would persecute and torture Christians in in some awful ways. But in general, Christianity really began to spread and to grow um, during this period. So under the reign of Domitian and under the reign of Trajan were two periods of intense persecution. But in general, it was a time of peace. But as we said, the church began to slip away in their affection for Christ. And what began to develop was the clergy. The idea that there is a ruling class among the people of God. And they're the ones that have to approve everything. And they're the ones from whom we get our ministry. And that is something that is false. It is um, contrary to the word of God and to the leading of his spirit. So that began to develop um, during this time. Here's a book that was written actually in the 4th century by St. Ambrose. And we can see that by that time it had become fully developed. And there was books and there was procedures for the clergy to follow. But this all began in the Ephesus period. And the Lord may reference that when he speaks of the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The word Nicolaitans could be decomposed into two words. Nico meaning um, conquer, and laity means people. 
So it means to conquer the people. The idea of this ruling class among the people of God. But Ephesus is commended for hating those deeds. And largely speaking, while the clergy began during this time, they still had a hatred for it. So who were some of the leaders during this time? These are some of what are considered the church early church fathers. There was Polycarp of Smyrna. He was one who was educated by the Apostle John himself. Then there's Clement of Rome. And he is the one who most likely is referenced by the Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians. He's the one that the Catholic Church claims to be their third pope, even though if you look into history, there's no reference at all to him being considered a pope at that time. And this is one of the issues with church history is that the Catholic Church became the historian for the church for a long time, and so they, they tended to twist the records and the way they presented it to fit their vision of the church. So that's one of the challenging things with church history. So we're better off coming back to the word of God and, um, and sticking with that. But Then there's Ignatius of Antioch. Now, Ignatius is one who really pushed the clergy. So he would be one who was a great supporter of that system. Ignatius is a very interesting man. He seemed to have a strong desire to, to die in some bloody and gory way in the arena. And uh, I just wanted to read a couple quotes for you. So as he was traveling to Rome, Ignatius would uh, stop in various cities in Asia Minor, and he would write these epistles from Ignatius to such and such a, a church. And these are some of the things he would say. Let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts. Rather entice the wild beasts that they may become my tomb and leave nothing of my body. May I enjoy the wild beasts that are prepared for me, and I pray that they may be found eager to rush upon me, which also I will entice to devour me speedily. And not deal with me as with some whom out of fear they have not touched. But if they be unwilling to assail me, I will compel them to do so. So this, this man was really looking forward to it. He actually says, let tearings, breakings, and dislocations of bones, let cutting off of members, let shatterings of the whole body, and so on, be upon me. So this man, he was really looking forward to his martyrdom. But each of these three did die a martyr's death. So these are the... Uh, three of the early church fathers. And uh, while the clergy developed during their tenure, the, um, in general, they were faithful in putting down false apostolic successors which wanted to turn the church in the wrong direction. Here's a quote that we were able to come, come up with from Mr. Darby concerning the church fathers. As to the fathers, I have read some, consulted almost all, and some a good deal. But when, many years ago, I set about to read them, I found them as a body such trash that I gave it up as a study. For history, they are, of course, useful, and I have examined them largely. So what you find when you read the Church Fathers is that doctrinally they got off very quickly. They really can't be, I would not recommend you read them as in their expositions on Philippians or their exposition on Romans. They very quickly got off in their doctrine. And so, not necessarily speaking about these three, but as the church, the church fathers that followed them, very quickly the church fathers got off in their doctrine. So um, we can be thankful to the Lord for recovering the truth to us that we have. So Smyrna is the next period. Smyrna means suffering. It comes from the same from the root word myrrh, which means suffering. And it was a period of intense persecution from the Romans. In each of these letters, Christ presents himself in a different way. He presents himself to the church in Smyrna as the one who has conquered death. And if they were to be called to give the, the ultimate sacrifice, to give their lives, their savior was the one who has conquered death and they would be raised. But against the church of Smyrna was leveled by Satan a double attack. From without, there was persecution that came upon the church from the, from the Roman world, the pagan world. From within, there were those who tried to spread Judaizing doctrines, Jewish teachings to try to convert the, the church and get it off from its purpose and get it onto Jewish ground. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But they were exhorted to be faithful unto death, and the Lord would give them a crown of life, and many of them were faithful unto death. And they were promised that the persecution would only last ten days. Ten days, if you look into the Old Testament where ten days is used, 
It speaks of a limited period of trial. Remember, Daniel asked to be tried on that oatmeal or whatever that was he was eating, the pulse, for 10 days. It was a limited period, and it would be over. And sure enough, there came a time when that period ended and the persecution stopped. But the 10 days may also refer to 10 distinct periods of persecution that occurred at this time from Nero to Diocletian. If you look through history, you can see 10 distinct periods during the Smyrna um, time frame. And it's held out to them that even if they were killed, they, they would not be hurt at the second death. The worst they can do is take your life. They cannot touch your eternal security. So they were tortured. They were killed in awful ways. Um, they were taken to the arena. They were crucified. They were burned alive. They were, their bodies were used to light the parties of the emperors. They, they were drowned. Many awful things. It's not my purpose to go into it. But um, suffice it to say, they suffered greatly for the name of Christ. So the persecution came from the pagan world. Why? First of all, spiritual reason. That is, Satan is opposed to Christ. The cross of Christ separates the church from the world. And so the, church, the world is going to be opposed for, to us. All they that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And they did. Another interesting thing was is that the, the church was surrounded by pagans who were polytheists. They believed in many gods. It's interesting, if you read some of this early documentation, the pagans accused Christians of being atheists. It's funny because Christians and atheists are like polar opposites today. But to the pagans, who believed in many gods, to only believe in one god was to believe in no god at all. So they accused Christians of being atheists. So very different. Politically, Christianity began to compete with the state religion. As, as Christianity began to grow in number, it also started to upset the political spectrum. Culturally, Christians were just different. They lived peaceably, quietly, and humbly. They worshipped simply, and they lived separately from the pagans who were um, very morally corrupt. So, to the pagans, Christians were just weird, and you persecute weird people, and that's what they did. Economically, the growth of Christianity really started to upset the economy because so much of the Roman economy was based on the making of idols, the making of images, the uh, idolatrous priesthood, and all of this started to become upset, and the, the result was persecution. They were unfairly blamed for things. Once a Roman army returned from Asia and brought with it a great disease to the city of Rome and spread through the city, and they said, it's because of the Christians, and they blamed it on the Christians. Another time, the Tiber River overflowed and flooded part of the city of Rome, and they said, it's because of the Christians. So they just began to be blamed for just about everything. When, much of it, when all of it or much of it was unfounded. So they were persecuted, as I said before, using all kinds of ghastly forms of torture. And um, they, were, they stood faithful for the name of Christ. But there was the second attack. One was from without and one was from within. Can you guess which one was, was successful? It was the one from within. It was the less obvious. The lurements from the Jewish world. There were those, the Lord speaks of, that say that they themselves are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There were those that didn't understand that Christianity and Judaism are distinct. You cannot mix them. The Lord Jesus himself spoke of that. You cannot put new wine into old bottles. And they tried to bring in things from the Jewish world, the priesthood, robes, candles, incense, the keeping of the law, ceremonies, all these things to try to Judaize the church. And the persecution really did help slow the tide of evil because persecution is one of the best things for the church in a spiritual way. Not in a physical way, but in a spiritual way. And so <clears throat> some of, a few of the uh, important figures during the Smyrna period, these are names you might know, Justin Martyr, a very interesting fellow. As you might guess, he earned his last name the hard way. He uh, was fairly well taught, I believe, for his time. He was born into a pagan family. He was saved at a, at, a, at a later age by an old preacher. Very interesting story how he was converted. But he basically passed himself off as a, as a philosopher. He found a way to kind of go under the radar 
The Romans were very favorable towards um, philosophers, and so he actually started a school right in Rome, right under the nose of the emperor, and was preaching the gospel, passing himself off as a philosopher. He eventually was, um, was caught, though, and he was tortured and, and beheaded. So there he is, a fairly handsome-looking fellow. Then we have Irenaeus. Irenaeus was educated by Polycarp, who actually, as we see, we, what we saw in Ephesus, was taught by the Apostle John. His most famous writings, his most famous book, was a, was a work called Against Heresies, where he really combated Gnosticism. Now, if you remember, which of the apostles spoke, wrote against Gnosticism? Does anyone know? John, yes, very good. So Gnosticism was a, was a movement of those who believed that they had the gnosis, which is the Greek word for objective knowledge. They thought they had more light. And ultimately, they really denied that Jesus was a man. And they denied that he um, truly was, had come in the flesh, and they were antichrist in that way. And a number of other things they denied. But you know what's interesting? If you read against heresies, Irenaeus... Um, he begins to reminisce. He'll take a little time out from his doctrine and he'll start reminiscing about when he was in his younger days, when he was in the school of Polycarp. And as he's in the school of Polycarp, Polycarp will be teaching, and Polycarp will start to reminisce about the time when he was in the school of John. So as you, as you read those portions of his book, you get the sense that you knew the guy who knew the guy who knew the guy who walked with Jesus. So it's kind of a nice touch with Irenaeus. Irenaeus, remarkable grasp of prophecy. The church fathers, like I said, began to give up doctrine left and right. But this man, he believed in, a, he believed in the rapture. I recently found out a seven-year tribulation, Antichrist coming to power at the middle of the seven-year tribulation, followed by the return of Christ, setting up the millennium. Very remarkable grasp of prophecy for, for his time. And there he is, another handsome-looking fellow, then there's Tertullian. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on him. He was a lawyer, and as one historian I read said, he had one client, and that was the church. And he really defended the church to uh, the Romans. And, and he, he, wasn't, he was not clear on his doctrine. He, he denied the Trinity in his doctrine, and he, he did teach that the Son and the Spirit were, were inferior to the Father. And at the end of his life, kind of a black mark on his name, he fell into something called Montanism which is like an early version of, of Pentecostalism. They believed in ecstatic visions and higher revelations than the word of God. So he kind of had a bit of a sad end, but he was another very influential figure during this Smyrna period. Now we get to the next period, which is Pergamos. Pergamos means marriage, and it was during this period that the church became married to the world. So Christ presents himself as a sharp sword. And we know from the word of God that sharp swords are used in connection with cutting and making a clean division. Remember in Hebrews, the word of God is like a, sh a sharp two-edged sword piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Soul and spirit are two things that are very hard to distinguish, but the word of God can do it. So the Lord Jesus has presented himself as one who has the sword that can discern between what is real and what is false. What we're going to see in Pergamos is a lot of growth. But how much of it was real? Sad to say, not much. This is when all the great cathedrals were built, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. I have a little bit of material on Pergamos. So the church began to dwell, as the Lord says, where Satan's seat is. Satan's seat is the world. So they really began to dwell right in the world, which is a very dangerous place for a Christian to be. They're commended, though, for some measure of holding fast. I do want to show a few examples of those of the Pergamos period who held fast. Antipas was one of them. He was some faithful brother back in the Pergamos assembly 2,000 years ago, and he was slain. And there were those during this Pergamos period of church prosperity that were killed for their faithfulness and who suffered greatly for their faithfulness. They're rebuked for some who hold the doctrine of Balaam. If you go back to the Old Testament, you can see very clearly what the doctrine of Balaam was. The doctrine of Balaam was, how can we get the judgment of God, how can we get God to judge his people? It was a two-step process. 
Number one, get them to go after the pleasures of this world. The children of Israel began to commit fornication with idolatrous peoples. Part number two, get them identified with pagan idols. That's the process. That's the very same process that Satan used during the Pergamos period to um, get the, the church of God identified with idols. He offered them luxury and followed it up with idolatry. So that's really, I think, the big lesson we want to take, um, one of the big lessons we want to take from Pergamos. We have to talk about Constantine. Constantine, as Jeremy could tell us, was a very important emperor. He was proclaimed emperor in 306 AD by the army. He was a very popular general, very successful general. And uh, by popularity, he was pushed into that place. A little bit about his background. His mother was very favorable towards Christianity, although it isn't quite clear whether she was really saved or not. She was very favorable. The other thing is, is that Constantine noticed himself that Christians made better subjects than pagans did. They were better behaved. So he kind of had this all in his head. And when he got into this position of power, he changed uh, Christianity and changed the Roman Empire um, for history. In 312 AD, Constantine united the eastern and western parts of the Roman Empire. This happened at a famous battle called the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. How many of you have heard of the Battle of the Milvian Bridge? Few. Okay, that's good. So this is a very important battle. <clears throat> and um, it was at this time, before that battle, the night before that battle, where he was to go out and meet his rival, Maxentius, out on the battlefield. <clears throat> he had a vision, supposedly. I'm not sure how literally to take this, but this is the story. He had this vision, and uh, it was a vision, and Christ appeared to him and said, you can go into battle tomorrow, and in this sign conquer. That's the famous line from his vision. And supposedly Christ showed him this sign in the sky. It was a Cairo symbol, which is the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ, Christos. And so... Constantine was very superstitious. He took this very seriously. He went back to his generals. They, they, they took out their magic markers and colored it on their flags and their shields and whatever all else. And in this, in this sign, they went out the next day into battle. And this is the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And, and just, just a quick little, what happened was Maxentius, he, he went across the Milvian Bridge which was right outside the city of Rome, and he destroyed the bridge itself, the old bridge. And in, in its place, he built a bridge out of pontoon boats. And his thought was, if he needed to escape from Constantine, who was a brilliant general, that he could cross this bridge of pontoon boats and then destroy the pontoon boats quickly, and he would escape from Constantine and save his own neck. That was his idea. Well, Constantine soon got the upper hand, and Maxentius decides, time to turn around, use my pontoon bridge, and escape. Well, as his army is crossing this pontoon bridge, it begins to collapse. And a portion of his army drowned in the sea. The rest of his army was trapped, slaughtered by Constantine. Constantine rides up to the edge of the river and, you know, sees Maxentius, you know, sinking into the water under the weight of his armor. And he actually himself drowned this time. So is this miraculous victory in this sign conquer? He goes out and it's this miraculous victory. So he takes this as a sign that changed, I think, history. The next year, he issued the Edict of Milan, which didn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, but it changed the Roman Empire's official policy towards Christians and said that they were now going to be favorable towards them. No more persecution for Christians. But 10 years later, he had forced Christianity on the whole empire through baptism, and it was a few years later that it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And this is the marriage between the church and state. This is something that is abhorrent to God. Not only is it a terrible idea, but it's something that God hates. The church is to be separate from this world. But in the Pergamos period, the opposite. Constantine made himself head of the Christian church. Who is the head of the Christian church? It's Christ. Constantine took that place for himself. He remained the Roman Empire, and he never even relinquished his place as head of the pagan church. So not only do you have the church and the world coming together, but you have the church and paganism coming together in the Pergamos period. 
Christians who had been persecuted, who had been battered throughout the Smyrna period now, were treated with the highest honors. The, the empty pagan cathedrals, which had been abandoned when the conversion occurred, were given over to Christians. They were offered to them. They had been meeting in humble meeting rooms and in house churches, and suddenly they went from rags to riches. Constantine himself apologized to Christians for their treatment by the Roman Empire. In fact, there's this famous scene that occurs in the uh, First Council of Nicaea, which we'll talk about in a minute, when Constantine, who presided over that first great ecumenical council, he came into the room at the beginning of that conference, and there were clusters of men talking here and there. And one of the groups that was given the most prestigious place was a group of old men. They had limbs missing. They had eyes missing. They had suffered greatly during the Smyrna period. And Constantine came over to them, and he hugged them. He kissed them. He kissed the empty eye sockets on these old sufferers for the name of Christ. And then he got down on his knees before them. And it was like a symbol that now the Roman Empire, who has persecuted Christians for all this time, is suddenly favorable now to, to Christianity and gives them the highest honors. So it was a tremendous change. Thou shalt have tribulation ten days. There did come a time when that persecution came to an end. But sadly, Satan had something far more dangerous than persecution in store for the church. And I'm sad to say that Christians took the bait during the Pergamos period. So he gave all those pagan holidays, Christian names. You know, pagans lived their lives around holidays. They had these week-long holidays or full of drunkenness, full of sexual immorality. And they would refuse to convert to a religion that didn't have any of this stuff. So Constantine says, no problem, we'll just make them Christian. And you can continue doing all the same types of immoral things that you were doing. That's where we get our um, many of our holidays that came out of this period. Christmas and Easter really came from that. And so Satan was very successful at um, getting the church associated with idols who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a snare before the sons of Israel to eat of idol sacrifices and to commit fornication. So that's when this really all began. So now we needed to talk about another very important thing. We said that there were some in the Pergamos period who held fast. And there's a man that we're going to read about here who held fast. By this time, Arianism... We talked about Gnosticism. Now this is Arianism. Had taken hold in Christendom. It had spread throughout. Constantine himself subscribed to Arianism. What is Arianism? It basically teaches that the Son of God was not always God. That he was created at a certain time. It denies the eternal deity of Christ and the eternal sonship of Christ. And it said that he was of a different substance. He was a lower order than the Father, which is blasphemy. Jesus is equal with God. The Son is equal with the Father. And that began to spread, and it had really divided the empire. So Constantine just said, we've got to get everyone on the same page. And so he convened the first ecumenical church council, the Council of Nicaea in 325. <clears throat> so he got everyone in the same room. He himself favored the Arian position. But God raised up Athanasius, a very faithful man, to combat this doctrine of Arianism. Arius, you can see on the upper right, he is a scary-looking guy, most likely because the Catholic artists um, knew he was a heretic and painted him that way. <laughs> but Athanasius, on the other hand, is another handsome-looking fellow. Um, but this man was, was faithful. And, you know, I just, I really appreciate him. He was seen running from room to room at the First Council of Nicaea with his Bible, showing people the truth from the Word of God. Here it is, here it is. Christ is equal with the Father. The Son is equal with the Father. And through his faithfulness, primarily, and a few others, the truth of the Trinity was maintained throughout weeks of fighting, wrestling, literally. There was one case of face slapping that occurred in the First Council of Nicaea. You know, one historian I read said it wasn't like a lot of people imagine it. 
Because at the end of this council, what was produced was the Nicene Creed. It wasn't like at the end of this peaceful Bible study, the Nicene Creed just floated down out of the sky. And, no, it was, it was ugly. But God overruled, and the Nicene Creed, for all of its failures, for all of its shortcomings, for all of the reasons why it's not good to have a creed, it affirmed the truth of the Trinity. It affirmed that the Son was equal with the Father, that the Son was homoousia, same substance as the Father. And so it's just a tremendous um, display of faith on the part of this man, Athanasius. Well, Athanasius spent the rest of his life defending this. Arius, who who was uh, excommunicated as part of the First Council of Nicaea, was later reinstated by Constantine. And... um, Athanasius himself was exiled and restored five times through the remainder of his life over his faithfulness. This man was a champion uh, of the truth. I'm not saying he was right on everything, but you just see these little little bright spots. Thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. The next thing I just want to briefly mention is the canonization of the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament had been received about in the first century before Christ, but the New Testament had been left to languish for many years. It was not clear which book was a part of the New Testament and which book wasn't. But in 367, I believe, yes, Athanasius, in a letter that he wrote, listed the 27 books, which would later become the, uh, the New Testament canon. And it actually it even took longer than that to officially be received by the church 20 years after his death. But this is the time in which this happened. So, um, so that's another thing we can be very thankful for is the, uh, that finally, after many years, the canon was officially received by the church. Now here's another um, very interesting point I want to make, a really story I want to tell, just to kind of give you the example of the types of characters that lived during this time. Ambrose and the discipline of Theodosius. This is a very interesting story. You know, in the Pergamos period, you had this great time of declension and this growth of what is false and not what is real. But here and there, you have these little bright spots that you see. And you see this with Ambrose. Ambrose um, was the bishop of Milan. He was, a, he was put there by the people. He really didn't want that position himself. He was a very, I believe, a very faithful man in a personal way. And he was brought into this position and it was, under the, it was during the time of the Emperor Theodosius. And just to make a long story short, the people of Thessalonica, we have two New Testament letters written to Thessalonica, they had done something to offend the emperor. I can't remember what it was, but they, they'd done something to incur his wrath. And so he told his captains, let loose the sword in the city of Thessalonica. And they did. First, uh, Theodosius said, don't do it. He canceled the order, but later they got permission, and eventually they let loose the sword in the city of Thessalonica. And between 50 and 60,000 citizens, men, women, and children, were slaughtered in cold blood. It was, it was awful. This all in the name of Theodosius, emperor of Rome. Theodosius was a Christian, I believe, from, from studying him, if there's any of these emperors that we'll see in heaven, it's probably this guy. He was a mass murderer. So, anyways, Theodosius went to church every Sunday at the, uh, at the cathedral in Milan. Ambrose, who was the bishop, wrote a letter to him and said, said to him, don't bother coming to church on Sunday because you've got blood on your hands. Very faithful. He wrote to the Roman Empire and Roman Emperor and said, "Don't come to church on Sunday." Theodosius came anyways. So Theodosius shows up at the church on Sunday, and this is the famous painting. Ambrose comes to the door of the church. He meets him at the door and he holds out his hand and he refused to give the Roman Emperor entrance into the church. And in this famous exchange that occurred between. Ambrose, I don't know that he was dressed that way, but that's how the artist had him. Ambrose uh, and Theodosius had this little exchange. Theodosius, who knew his Bible, said to Ambrose, but do you remember King David, how he was a murderer, how he murdered Uriah? 
And yet he was restored to the Lord. I'm just like King David. Can't I be restored? And Ambrose famously said, you have imitated David in his crime. Now let us see you imitate David in your repentance. And he refused. And for eight months, for eight months, he refused to let the emperor um, come, to, come to church. So for all of his failures and his shortcomings and his imbibing of the clergy, here you see a little example of those who God used in some small way to, to uh, honor his name. And eventually Theodosius was restored. And from everything I can read, he, he truly was repentant, but God only knows. The next character I want to quickly talk about, and this is right at the end, and we're going to take a break, is Augustine. This is one of the most influential figures in church history. He's considered one of the, one of the early fathers still at this time. Here's a, here's a picture of him. He's another handsome-looking fellow. He, um, he, he greatly changed um, the course, I believe, doctrinally speaking, of the church. He was converted in a very interesting manner. He struggled with, uh, with perverted thoughts and perverted ideas. He lived a very immoral life. And he really struggled with, with the idea of sin. And he could never seem to find a way to get deliverance from it. He tried many religions, many methods, and was unable to, uh, to find deliverance from it. But he was, as, as, as the story goes, he was converted by when he one day he overheard a young boy singing Telelegi, 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 like skipping rope or something and singing this little song, which by interpretation is open and read. And so he opened the Bible and he began to read and he found deliverance in some regard from his sinful ways. He, um, like I said, he's viewed as one of the most influential church fathers, but he began his life pre-millennial and his eschatology. So what that means is he believed that the coming, that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to literally come back to this world and after he came back, he would set up his millennial kingdom of righteousness and peace. That's what it means to be pre-millennial. I believe that's the scriptural uh, position. But he rejected that. And instead he taught amillennialism, which means no millennium. And he believed that the church is the kingdom. There's no coming reign of Christ. The church is the kingdom. That Christ is reigning right now through the church. That we have to try to take over the governments and spread our influence. Christ isn't going to do it. We've got to do it. What a sad position um, to take. And you can see how this drastically changed um, um, Christianity historically. One of the things you have to do if you take that position is you have to allegorize prophecies. He was very Greek in the way he thought. The Greeks are famous for their mythology. The Greeks can take a passage of scripture, and by the time you're done with it, it doesn't mean anything. It's just a bunch of fluffy ideas. They would take Old Testament scriptures that are crystal clear, like the wall shall be built again from the fish gate to the, the Tower of Hananiel. I may be misquoting that where it's clearly talking about a literal rebuilding of Jerusalem in the millennium. And he would allegorize that and deny that and take things that are crystal clear and, and, and obviously meant to be literally interpreted and allegorize them. He wrote a book called The City of God in which he presented many of these ideas. This book is still being read today and it is um, very influential. Um, there's a there's a copy of it, an old version, I think. And, and in the teachings of Augustine, we get the roots of covenant theology. The idea here with covenant theology is it's not the glory of Christ that is the purpose of God. It's the blessing of man that's the purpose of God. We have to know that. From down into our hearts, we have to know that God's purpose is to glorify his Son, and that is the uniting theme of the whole word of God, the glorification of his son. But the roots of covenant theology can be traced all the way back to this book and to Augustine. So just in conclusion, what is Christendom? We use that term. Well, the term Christendom comes from the idea of baptism, which is often called christening. So Christendom is that 
sphere that is formed by baptism. Because there are many, many that were brought into the profession of Christianity that were not really saved. They didn't really have faith, but they were brought in by baptism. And so what is Christendom? Well, this is the way I like to think about it. This is really helpful for me. In Ephesus, you have Christianity. Yes, they had left their first love, but it was still desirable. It was Christianity at the, at the kernel. In Smyrna, you had those Judaizing teachers, the synagogue of Satan coming in. Now you have Christianity plus Judaism. But in Pergamos, not only do you have Christianity and Judaism, but now you add paganism. And that unholy mixture is what we refer to as Christendom. All the cathedrals, all the holidays, all the mixture between the world, paganism, Judaism, Christianity, all lumped together, which is an abomination to God. Um, That is where this all um, came from. I think we need to remember that prosperity does not mean spiritual growth. You have tons of prosperity in the Pergamos period, but sad to say, a great deal of failure. And this map just kind of shows us the extent of uh, Christendom at this time. It had expanded beyond the borders of the Roman Empire and and quickly um, conquered the known world. And I believe that's where we'll stop so we can take a 15-minute break. Everyone can get up and uh, get, get themselves a coffee, and then we'll get back together.